Hello, everyone. What a great crowd today. Yes, hello. <laughs> We are so excited to be here. We all know the amazing Candace Bushnell as the best-selling author of books like Sex in the City and The Carrie Diaries. But she's back with a new book called Is There Still Sex in the City, um, which tackles dating after 50. Um, so Candace, you've talked a lot about battling ageism and how women over 50 are sort of an afterthought in American society. So tell me about the impetus for this book and how knowing that factored into to, to what you wrote about. Well, it really came out of, out of my own experiences. And when I got to the end of my 40s, I think I'd written, I guess I'd written seven books. I was feeling really, really burned out on relationships. And I was thinking, you know, there really isn't that much to say. And I'd actually gotten to, I mean, one of the things that I realize now, looking back on it, um, you know, one of the reasons why Sex in the City really resonated so much is that it was really about a very particular passage in time. And when I started writing Sex in the City, this passage of time women being single and childless in their 30s was really considered a, actually a bit shocking. It was not accepted, you know, and there was this idea that these women must have really done something wrong because they were still single. And for me, um, it was really almost like an anthropological thing. Why are there all these great 30-something single women and really no great guys to marry them. And it ended up becoming really a passage in time between when you were traditionally leave your parents' house, which is what people did for, you know, probably, we don't even know how long. You know, you went, if you were a woman, you went from your parents' house to a marriage home. And what we've had now, literally in the last 50 years, is a new passage where women are allowed to go to college, go out into the world, have a career, have a shot at capturing the income stream. And that is the sex in the city years. And it could be, you know, anywhere after college until you settle down into what I call the reproductive lifestyle. And this is really where a lot of people feel like they find their happily ever after, you know, like the characters on Sex in the City. And in my real life, uh, you know, all of my many, many Sex in the City friends who I had during my Sex in the City passage, like me, they all ended up getting married and, uh, you know, or finding partners. Many, many had children. And so basically they found their version of a happily ever after. And, you know, certainly as a woman, like for us, that's pretty much when it ends. Like after that, nothing really worthwhile at all is supposed to happen to you, except you're supposed to fade away. Um, and indeed in the past, 50 something, it was really the beginning of retirement, of slowing down, and people really did not expect 50 something women to do, you didn't do much of anything. You know, maybe you worked a little bit less, you maybe played golf a little more, you were a grandma, <laughs> you let your hair go gray, you wore sensible shoes, you wore like beige clothes, because like who cares, right? And it was fine, but that is not what pretty much any 50-something woman's life looks like today. And so it was really inspired by what happened to me, which was that I got divorced in my early 50s. And I found, wait, once again, I'm single. And in a lot of different ways, I have to start all over again. And at first I thought I was the only person in the situation and I was kind of, you know, there's a bit of shame that comes from getting divorced. I mean, it really is true that all of the married couples, they don't invite you, you don't fit in. 
And, and there was a lot of judgment, you know, I heard a lot of whispering, you know, all these single women over 50. And I was like, wait, I think I've heard something like that before, except they were the, saying the single women over 30. Mm. And, and I realized that this, you know, seemed to once again be, you know, a, really a new passage and, you know, uh, sort of tagging off of what Arthur was talking about, um, you know, in the in your fifties, it's not just that you have to start over. You, especially if you're a woman, you have to start over in different circumstances. Mm -hmm. Number one, you're probably not fertile. That baby making organ, it's out of bit. It's retired. That is retired. You are not, but that is. Um, and, if, you know, it probably doesn't matter in the larger sense, except that for women, the message that we get is that so much of our self-worth mm. comes from being young and fertile. And, you know, if you're a heterosexual woman, you know how important it is to be attractive to the male and you know and you know how uh, important it is to do the care and feeding of a male and you know all of that yeah. and when you get to be over 50 and you've gone through menopause those things don't really apply so in a sense society's telling you that you are invisible and what society told you when you were younger what your value was, you don't have those cards anymore. So for a lot of women, this is a time of, you know, it is a time of upheaval when you kind of have to reach down and really think about what is my value in society and who am I? Right. Now, for a lot of women, um, there are Getting uh, women getting divorced in their late 50, uh, late 40s, early 50s, and initiating the divorce is a very common thing, and it usually happens because women feel so deadened by their relationships that they feel that if they don't get divorced at this time, forget it, it's all over for them because they really can't reinvent themselves at 60. That seems really impossible. Um, so dating is once again, part of this passage and like sex in the city, it too has interesting and new sociological patterns. Right, right. I want you, you mentioned upheaval and I wanted to talk about, so when you do wake up and you're there and you have to sort of start over, right? You have to reinvent your life. In the book, you talk a lot about balancing a community. So you had a group of girlfriends who you leaned on and then also finding solace in solitude. Like you went inward and you mm -hmm. started to enjoy not loneliness, but solitude. So can you talk about how community and sort of depending on yourself, how those two things played a part in, in your reinvention? Yes, I, I think I can. <laughs> um, I, you know, the solitary part of it is it's very interesting and I, I, you know, think about it a lot because it's like, it's one of those things, is it just something that happens to me? It, it makes you feel that way. Like, is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong with me? And I think that's one of the tricky parts about this passage is that there's so little research on it that you don't really know, like, actually what's normal when it comes to aging. And one of the things that I've observed is I noticed that a lot of people, my fr myself included, when we got to be in our later 40s, all of a sudden socializing and all those people who you're really good friends with, you just feel like, I don't like anybody. Hmm. I mean, has anybody ever felt that way? Like, <laughs> you know, it's just so weird. I used to have so many friends and now I don't even know if I like all those friends. And it seems to be some kind of, and you know, I don't know if it's some kind of adjustment in one's brain, but you know, also one of the things that I think about is 
you know, if we have brains as women and there's a, we've had, you know, there are a lot of hormones in there. Um, like one of the things that I noticed having gone through menopause is like, you know what? All of a sudden I just didn't care. It's like the beer goggles were removed, especially when it comes to the opposite sex. I want to talk about the beer goggles because... <laughs> but I mean, there are all kinds of changes. So, yeah. So for me, it was, you know, it was, I experienced all these things and, you know, there were times when I thought, oh my God, like, <gasps> it's all over for me and I'm really just going to be by myself. And then I got out of that and I, and I found like a renewed interest in socializing mm. again. But I will say that that's definitely one of the dangers of this time, I think certainly for women, because if you do end up getting divorced, and like Arthur said, you know, a lot of people do end up moving at this time because you're downsizing or you're changing, you're looking to the future, you know, you may lose a parent. So you have a lot of they are actually life altering stressors that happen all at once. And I have had friends who they've gone to bed and they've pulled the covers over their head and they have stayed in that bed for a little bit too long. Mm. So that's one of the real dangers, yeah, yeah. I think. And where friendship is so important. Like you really, you gotta look out for your friends. Right, right. You talked, you mentioned beer goggles and sort of having this, I guess, new sense of the way things are and the way things you want them to be with regard to men and friendship. So what are those things that maybe you were looking for in your 20s or 30s or 40s that now at your age, you're just kind of like, those things aren't important. This is what I look for in a partner. This is what I well, look for in friendship. you know, I do, I do think, I mean, like, you know, one of the things that also is a factor is, you know, men should change as well because they lose their hormones too. <laughs> they go down a lot. The difference is that, you know, men have about 77 products to deal with, you know, aging issues like low T or erectile dysfunction, and women literally have maybe three. So there is a sexist difference there. Um, um, but, I, you know, one thing is, you're not looking to reproduce, okay? If I see, I'm sorry, but if I see a 55-year-old guy, I'm not thinking, dude, I want to have a baby with you. And, you know, <laughs> and, you know, who I want to have a baby with is probably, honestly, I have different standards for that mm -hmm. than, you know, somebody who hey, I want to hang out with and I want to have a good time with. Um, I think that people are looking, you know, a lot of people, they're not looking for excitement, you know? They're not, you're not looking for like, oh, I'm not looking for that, uh, you know, crazy person who's always got a problem. It's like, I got enough problems, okay? I'm looking for a problem solver. As a, as a partner, not a problem maker, a problem solver. And, I, I, you know, empathy, somebody who's nice and like somebody who really kind of gets it, those things are important. And those are, they're things that women feel like when they were in a relationship, you know, you give up a lot of things when you're in a relationship for a variety of reasons, usually for the good of the relationship and the good of the children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when women get free of that, you know, a lot of them are like, I'm not putting up with that attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not putting up with somebody who doesn't lift a finger. I'm not, you know, and for some women, the answer is, you know what? I've been caretaking other people my entire life. Hallelujah, I'm free. <laughs> And I am not going to caretake anyone. So, you know, there's also a group of women who, they did relationships. They don't want to do them anymore. They've got other things that they want to work on. Got it. We have about five more minutes, so I'm going to open it to questions now. Um, we have a couple that are coming up on the board. 
Well, in the meantime, um, while that while we wait for that, um, so you've made a point to be like to, to say that is there still Sex in the City, which is being made into a TV series, is not going to be a remake of Sex in the City. So no, talk to us a bit about the series. Yes, talk about um, that. I, it's totally different characters, which gives us so much more flexibility. The thing is, the Sex in the City characters, I mean, you know, think of where they've been. You know, they, they were in New York, then they ended up like on camels. And then Carrie's in a beer commercial. So until someone can explain to me how Carrie Bradshaw ended up in a beer commercial, no. Um, I, there's just, there's too much stuff to bring them into, you know, a different, a totally different narrative. Right. It's, 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 it just makes no sense. Um, and, and I really just started working on it. So we're at the very beginning when we would, uh, you, you know, where you just sit down and you work out like who all the characters are, where they are and mm -hmm. all that. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So we have a question now um, from Anonymous. Do you Wait. wish the Sex in the City characters would get together for Sex in the City 3? I feel like we just got there. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's so, it's so out of my thing that I don't actually yeah. think about it. Yeah. You know, it's like on the one hand, it could be fun. On the other hand, do we really need it? Right, right. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Right. Um, second question, are you more of a Carrie or a Samantha? Okay, so that is actually a, such a flattering question. <laughs> I cannot tell you, sweetie, I was never the Samantha. Oh, I have so many, you know, everyone's always like, do you have a char characters like a Charlotte, Miranda? Okay, my Charlotte was, she was a lot edgier than Charlotte. Um, and, and the reality is that most of my friends were like Samantha. Uh, and in fact, like at least six of them are like, I was the real Samantha. I'm like, you all were. Okay, did you see how much sex Samantha had on the show? <laughs> Not just one woman could do that. So, um, but I think that's a flattering, but yes, I'm the Carrie. Okay, gotcha. I'm and the Carrie and I have lots of Samantha friends. <laughs> and the guys always go for the Samantha friends. Okay. And our last question, um, any advice for women who feel the need to hide their age at work? Well, you know, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think what's at the core of it is the idea that any woman would have to hide her age at work. But the reality is that in these times that we live in, I have had a lot of women, you know, it's kind of blatant, some of the ageism. I mean, when I was just touring around on my book tour, you know, I met two women who worked at TV stations who were pivoting and they were both 50, 48, 50, and they both were pushed out mm. because they were too old. So that is really something, I mean, the answer to that is none of us should have to lie about our age. Why do we live in a society where we feel like we have to lie about our age and that could, an ageism is a real thing. Everyone, please join me in thanking Candace Bushnell. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>